I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. We're back with another reloading segment. Last week, we showed you how to charge our cases in preparation for our ladder test. This week, we went out to the range and actually shot our ladder test. Now, there are a ton of different ways to shoot a ladder test. Uh, what I prefer to do is set my target at 200 or 300 yards and then fire my entire string of charges from lowest to highest. Now, first of all, the reason I set my target at 200 or 300 is most of the rifles that we're working with are accurate enough that at 100 yards, they're just going to start to tear ragged holes when you fire that many shots. Now, a ragged hole is not going to tell us what we want to see because... On a ladder test, we want to see each one of those bullets making a nice distinct hole and we want to see where they start to group together. Now 200 yards will give you a little bit of separation, 300 yards is better and that will also show you the separation and velocity between them. Uh, this rifle is capable of sub MOA accuracy but it's not exactly a quarter MOA shooter. So I went ahead and picked 200 yards because that's the easiest to keep all the shots on the paper but still give us enough separation that the shots aren't actually impacting on top of each other. Now because I'm able to fire single well aimed shots and I trust my own ability to place those shots I only run one ladder and I go from lowest charge to highest charge. Regardless of how you do this your first ladder you want to run lowest to highest because when you fire each one of those charges you're going to inspect the case for any kind of signs of pressure. Now when you're inspecting the case for signs of pressure, things you want to look for are marks left on the case head from either the ejector or the extractor. Now uh, I'll show you some pictures here. The first set of cases that I'm going to show you are three cases that came out of an AR-10. Um, these show a little bit of curl of brass starting to rise up. That tells me that the pressure is just starting to get on the upper end of unsafe, or I'm sorry, on the bottom end of unsafe on this rifle because it's pushing enough brass back into the extract or in the ejector hole that when the bolt rotates it starts to shave this brass off. It can also cause reliability problems because those shavings can stack up in the ejector hole and cause the ejector to malfunction. So once you start seeing these that tells you you're at the upper end of pressure you need to stop. The next case I'm going to show you is a primer crater. Uh, what's happened here is the pressure has been enough to cause this primer to flow back into the firing pin hole. Now on factory Remingtons they tend to have a little bit oversized firing pin holes. So even on factory ammunition you may get a tiny bit of cratering but not to this extent. This tells you it's time to stop. Now firing pin craters are going to be very dependent upon how hard the actual material, the uh, primer cup is made out of. So if you have softer primers you may get a little bit more flow. If you have harder primers you may get to higher pressure before you start seeing this. Um, you also want to look for flattening of the primer. Unfortunately I don't have any pictures of primer flattening. I'm sure if you look it up on Google you'll be able to find a bunch of them. The primers that I use, the Federal Gold Medal Match, I really haven't seen any problems with them flattening at the pressure levels that I run. So I don't have any uh, first-hand experience of that. The last picture I'm going to show you is actually a blown out primer. Now these are obviously very, very easy to spot and when you start to get on in both the service life of the brass you're using and pressure levels on semi-automatic rifles especially, you can get to the point where when the rifle kicks the case out, the primer separates as well. Um, this is bad for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, that you're reaching pressure limits of the system. Uh, secondly being you can get those uh, blown primers jammed down into the action on AR type systems and it can really gum up the works. I really haven't seen blown primers on bolt action rifles. I'm sure that it can get there when you get on really high in brass life but I tend to retire my brass before I get to the point where I'm dropping primers out of it. Uh, softer brass you may reach that point sooner. Uh, Federal brass has a bad reputation for the primer pockets loosening up before the brass has really hit the end of its service life. So just keep that stuff in mind. Um, also, depending on the kind of system you're using, you may start to see the uh, case head swell out. The side of the case just ahead of the head may start to develop a swell. That tells you you're starting to reach the, pressure, the top 
pressure signs as well. Um, when a case fails, it's not really the weapon's fault. Uh, all the pressure of that round firing is contained inside the brass case. All rifles have some section of the case that's unsupported, be it the firing pin hole, be it an ejector um, recess, or being an extractor recess. Um, this is one of the reasons why I like to continue to use the Remington style extractor. I don't like to cut up my bolts for Saco extractors because you're cutting a big chunk out of the side of the bolt and that's one of the rifle safety mechanisms is there's no direct path for those pressures to vent if you have a case fail. It comes out of the pressure hole on the side here instead of coming out past the bolt and back towards your face. So just bear that stuff in mind. But if you notice any significant change in the condition of the brass, it's time to stop your test, stop your ladder right where you're at, and figure out what's going on. Uh, and maybe you've collected enough data there that you know, okay, now we're getting high in the pressure. Or it may be that you see pressure signs really down low, and then you really need to stop and figure out what's going on. Figure out if your brass is too long, if for some reason there's... Uh, too much tension, not allowing the bullet to cleanly separate from the case. So just stop if you see any kind of pressure signs. Don't be tempted to go ahead and shoot the rest of those cases. Also, it's very good practice to bring a bullet puller and a container for your powder to the range when you go do your ladder test. That way when you fire that last shot of the ladder, go ahead right there and pull down the rest of those rounds and you won't be tempted to shoot them. You don't really want to pack them up, throw them in your range bag, bring them back home, and then two weeks later when you're out at the range, forget what those bullets are and decide to shoot them, and then you have pressure issues. So as soon as you see pressure signs, stop, pull them down, and you're done there. Now, as I stated, when we fire our ladder test, we're going to fire low to high at 200 yards. That's what we did for this test. If you've loaded a couple of different cartridges for each pressure, or I'm sorry, for each charge weight, then you'll want to shoot each one of those cartridges on a separate target. You'll notice our target here from when we did our ladder test, it looks like a big shotgun pattern. Uh, it looks like you fired a couple of rounds of uh, double out buck into this target. Now, this is just one charge going from, I believe we started at 35 and we went to 46 rounds are 46 grains. So 35 to 46 grains gives you quite a few cartridges to fire. If we fired two or three for each of those steps on this target, uh, we would again start tearing holes in the target and not really being able to see the separation between each shot. So set out a couple of different targets if you're going to do that. Now if you are going to fire more than one ladder, what I suggest is you fire from the bottom, the lowest charge, to the highest charge or until you see pressure signs on the first ladder. Now if you get to the point where you see pressure signs then on the next one you're going to start at that point and work your way down in charge weights back down to the bottom and this will give you a better idea than if you just fire one. We were kind of short on time so we didn't do multiple tests going up and down. Now if you do run into pressure signs on the way up you don't want to go any higher than that. Mark that down, you're done. When you go back down, start there. If you go all the way up and you hit your last charge weight and you don't see pressure signs, then feel free when you work your way back down to start at the top, your highest charge, and go all the way down. It's not going to be a big deal. Now, when you take a look at what we've got here, you'll notice that we'll start to get three and four shots that will group together. Now, I tend to look within a 1 MOA window. So this target was at 200 yards, so a 1 MOA window is going to be approximately 2 inches. It's actually a little bit more than that, but we're just using a rule of thumb for this, so it's approximately 2 inches. So we've got a couple of groups here. Um, with the 308s, I like to stick about the 2600 foot per second mark. That's where I start to look for my accuracy nodes. Um, Lower than that really doesn't interest me because you're going to start running into elevation issues when you start getting long range. Slower cartridges or slower bullets are going to give you more wind drift. So 2600 is a good intermediate speed for 175 or 178 grain 308. If we look at our target, 16, 17, and 18 gives us a pretty nice group. If we measure it, it's about 1.9. 
So that's a grain and a half spread on powder coming in at just at one minute of angle. Actually, a little bit under one minute of angle. Uh, if we look at 14, 15, and 16, then 14, 15, and 16 here is coming in at a 1.3 inch spread. However, 14, 15, and 16 is going to be a little slow for what I like. So I'll look for the higher node. And you can go through and you can see on your ladder test, start grouping where you've got three or four shots that are uh, grouping together. When you find that, find the middle of that node, take the middle charge weight, and that's what you're going to want to shoot for. Now once you find an accuracy node that you like, you can either go through and you can break down and charge some cases again with a mini ladder where you're either going 0.2 grains or 0.3 grains separation between them and shoot that charge range again and make sure you're grouping together. Maybe shoot it at a longer distance or you can do like I do because I'm lazy and I'll just take the center, I'll load up 20 or 30 charges with the center and then I'll go out and I'll shoot a grouping exercise with them and see what I get. If I like the results, I'll keep that load. If I don't like the results, then I'll chuck it. I'll go back, take a look at the ladder again, select a different node, and go out and roll with that. Uh, many times when I shoot my ladder, I will run a chronograph just to see what the velocities of each one of those charges is giving me, and that gives me a ballpark idea of what the ballistic results are going to be on it. But you don't need that if you're just shooting for accuracy. Now once we get done with our load workup, we'll go out and we'll check it over a chronograph because that gives us the information we need to set up our ballistic computer and set up our drop tables in order to accurately shoot out to a thousand yards. Now if you want to, once you've settled on what your charge weight is, now you can go back in and you can play with the seating depth of your bullet to try to fine tune that group and shrink your little groups down. Now, as I said, I like to load the magazine length for 308s, 2.80, and I'll just roll with that. However, if I'm working with something that either the chamber is shorter than magazine length or it's a special instance, I may go back and I may play with the seating depth a little bit just to see if we can fine tune things. Um, really, that's not something I generally do because I just don't have the time and I don't like to mess around with loads a whole lot. I like to just get the rifle shooting and then go with it. Now, a couple of issues that you have when you're running your ladder test is first of all, how do we know which shot holes are which? If you look at our target here, before we marked it, it just looks like a big shotgun pattern. There's really no intelligible results to it. Uh, so you've got to figure out how you can get which shot hole is which. Now the easiest is probably a spotting scope get a high resolution, high magnification spotting scope that you can actually see each shot hole at 200 yards and write down on a piece of paper in the log uh, each shot hole as you fire it. If you're going to do this, it can help to have a grid on the target down range and have a grid on your piece of paper because when you get 10, 15 shot holes into it, it can kind of be hard to get those holes exactly where they need to be in relation to the target down range. Uh, second method, if you have the time and if your range gives you the ability to do so, you can fire a shot, you can go down range, and you can either mark on the target or document with a camera or in your range book exactly where that shot hole impacted. Then come back and fire your next shot. The benefits of this are you're giving the rifle time to cool down, everything to reset, and then you're getting back down behind the rifle and firing the next shot. The disadvantage of this is you may be walking 200 yards down range, 200 yards back. If you're not in extremely good condition, that's going to elevate your heart rate, it's going to elevate your breathing. It's causing you to break position and then get back down and rebuild your position for each shot. This may not help your accuracy and it may cause you more problems. Besides the fact, it can take all day to run a ladder test. I've done it before. Uh, if you get other shooters on the range at the same time, it makes it extremely difficult because you have to wait until they go cold before you can go down range and mark your target. So I would leave that as one of the last resorts. Um, another option and one that I use very frequently is I set up a video camera down range to record the impacts. Obvious drawbacks to this are you don't want to put the camera in danger where somebody else might shoot it. And you want to be sure that you put the camera in a place where you're not going to shoot it. 
I feel pretty confident in my own abilities at 200 yards to keep my shots on paper and I offset the camera to the side and a little bit below the target. That way it's not actually even in the scope's field of view. So I'm confident I'm not going to shoot it. However, I have been doing a low workup before at 300 yards, had a camera down range, and had a gentleman come up and slap a magazine in his machine gun and start spraying rounds down range. We had to have a discussion and stop and go cold so I could go down and recover my camera before he continued uh, expending ammunition. So those are things to bear in mind with that method. Another method I have seen and I have heard of but I have not tried comes off of the 6millimeterbr.com website. They suggest taking Sharpie markers with different colors and coloring in your projectiles. Now, Obviously, it would take a whole bunch of different color markers to be able to cover the range of charges that we've used in this test. So what they recommend is once you've expended solid colors, you can then take the markers and color one side of the projectile one color, the other side of the projectile another color. Now the key here is to make sure that you don't duplicate colors or patterns and run into problems there. You also need to make sure that you're shooting on a white target, either white butcher paper or a white poster board or something where the color will actually transfer as the bullet goes through. Um, this is a method that they recommend and I'll leave a link in the description to the 6mm BR website uh, where they describe this. It sounds like a really uh, interesting concept. I just haven't had a chance to try it yet because the video process works well for me and it's fairly foolproof as long as the video camera doesn't shut off or you have battery issues or run out of memory while you're recording. Now we've gone through and what I've seen with this rifle is the 43 grains of Reloader 15 lands us in the middle of an accuracy node when we're running at a cartridge overall length of 2.80. Uh, this is consistent with uh, the standard military M118 LR load and it actually ends up being a fairly accurate load in just about every 308 I've tried it in. So for the duration of this we're going to go ahead and stick with 43 grains of Reloader 15 and a 175 grain Sierra or 178 grain uh, Hornady boat tail hollow point. Next week we're going to show you how to take those cartridges that we fired, those cases, and prepare them to reload them. We'll reload them with 15 grains, a reloader 15, and some more bullets, and we'll go back out and we'll verify what our accuracy results are. As always, if you've liked this video, make sure you click that thumbs up button. If you're a subscriber, Thank you. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. And until next week, get out and shoot! Well, now that we've got uh, lightweight and budget-minded out of the way, let's talk about the heavy-duty monster. Now, what I've got sitting in front of me here is an Accuracy International AX-308. Uh, AI was nice enough to send this over to us to give a spin. On top of it here, we have a Leupold Mark VI 3-18 by 44 power rifle scope. It has the locking zero-stop turrets which is a very nice feature. It also has a capped windage turret, which I've been asking for for quite some time in tactical rifle scopes. And it is the 3 to 18 power range, which is indicated by the Mark VI. Uh, Leupold likes to do that on their scopes. Mark VI indicates a 6 power factor, so 3 on the bottom end, 18 on the top. 3, by, three times 6 is 18. Uh, so that's how they like to go about naming their scopes on that. Uh, the scope has the Horus H58 reticle in it, which is not as busy as some of the other Horus reticles. Uh, it's still fairly busy, but I think it's a reticle I can work with. We're going to get this thing out. We're going to run some ammo through it, uh, kick the tires a little bit, and we're going to see what we get. And we'll do a full review video coming up, but a bunch of you guys saw the pictures of it on the Facebook and you wanted to see it on this episode. So, this is what you got. Now, Accuracy International North America is also nice enough to send us along some of their brand new pistol grip skins 
for the AE, AW, and the AICS chassis system. So we'll be taking a look at those here soon as well. So here's your gun porn for the week. Take a look at it. I also want to give a little shout out to you guys that have already pre-ordered the new logo hats. Uh, we've got a lot of orders coming in on them. I thank you guys a lot for supporting this project. Uh, we've got enough that we're at least going to break even on the project. I'm hoping to get uh, quite a few more orders rolling in. That way we can make some money for it and roll it back into some of our video projects. Got my eye on uh, some really nice new uh, video equipment that's going to help us up the production value quite a bit of these videos you watch and our review videos. So please keep those orders coming. If you haven't ordered already, I'll leave a link in the description section on where you can go to pick up one of these cool hats and support the project. Thank you.